Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò della New York University. My name is Stefano Albertini, I'm the director of the Casa. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all tonight to the Casa, if, if it is your first time here. Uh, just I wanted to know that you are in the Italian Cultural Center of New York University. It was established about 20 years, 28 years ago, and we have been active ever since. We organize about 100 and 120 events every year that span throughout all the possible fields of Italian culture and art. Uh, that includes the visual arts, cinema, music, um, history, and everything else. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Grazia D'Annunzio and another colleague, Eugenia Paulicelli, uh, created this series called Addressing Style. Uh, the series has been very active, and it has featured protagonists in the fields of architecture, fashion, photography, design, and many others. Uh, Grazia is really the soul and the backbone of this series, and I thank her for the passion and the commitment that she devotes to our series and in bringing to us uh, her guests, like the one that she has with us uh, tonight here. Uh, as it is normally uh, our habit, I don't want to take away from Grazia the pleasure of introducing to you her guest, Emanuele Della Valle. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano, and thank you all of you for being here tonight. And uh, thank you, Emanuele Della Valle, who found uh, in his very busy schedule uh, an hour for us. Emanuele Della Valle is um, a very creative uh, person, dear friend, and the former creative director and chief marketing officer of the Todd's Group, who is the, 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 the family group. And uh, now he became a very mm, interesting and uh, uh, mm, successful uh, film uh, director. He debuted last year with a feature movie that he wrote and directed called Wetlands. And we will talk about it later. So welcome, Emanuele. Not successful yet, but we're working on it. No, he got a very good reviews. So no, I mean, don't be too modest. OK, are you comfortable? Perfect. Okay, because when I met him, actually I saw him a couple of days ago, he asked me about the chairs at Casa Italiana. I say, are they comfortable? And I say, yes, but why? And I say, well, because you know what, when you have to, you know, be drilled with question and answer, it's better to be comfortable. So, okay, here we are. So how storytelling is important in fashion communication? Well, can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. I think that you know the success, the, the the measure of success of brands, certainly in the world of lifestyle and uh, you know luxury and fashion, is given more or less by two things. One is the quality of the products, and the other is the quality of the storytelling. And uh, you know the storytelling is important because it goes to the DNA of the brand, it goes to the legacy mm -hmm. of the brand and to its history. So I think if you know brands have these, you know not just these two components clearly, but if the products are great and the storytelling is great, you know, I think that, you know, they're, they're up to something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a kid, um, you um, were more uh, interested in listening, do you like more listening to uh, stories or you like to create your own stories? Both. I like to listen, you know, to the adults around, you know, talking all the time. And, uh, you know, I, would have to say I had quite a vivid imagination, mm -hmm. and I hope I still do. Otherwise, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of screwed, right? <laughs> and uh, so, I, you know, I would make up a lot of stories. And what kind of story did you like to make? Crime stories, mm -hmm. you know, noir stories, uh, love stories. I remember there fantasy was, stories. There was this relative of my grandmother who was in the world of shipping. You know, you had to do mm -hmm. something with boats, but something you know, on an administrative point of you know perspective and I turned him into a pirate that would loot <laughs> the Adriatic seas in his ships you know and I took it to school and I remember you know uh, you know <laughs> yeah they, they liked it you know and uh, yeah also I think you know like being an only child mm -hmm. you know you sort of indulge you know in these fantasies and you have time in your hands and uh, you know I've always liked you know mm -hmm. writing stories 
Uh, what did you receive first as a gift? Uh, um, a movie camera or uh, a camera? Camera. Polaroid was the kind uh, with leather finishing, the one that you would open up and you would put the disposable flash bulbs on top, the one that mm -hmm. once, you, once you clicked, the flash would go psh and would explode. And, and that was back in the 80s, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, late uh, 70s. Late 70s, mm -hmm. early 80s. And uh, everybody that would come to the house would get their portrait taken, serially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back then in a the small town, you would have the guy every Thursday would deliver two cases of sparkling water. Right? Yes, yes. So I would say, Mario, sit down, please. <laughs> photo, right? And then, you know, my, the, my grandmother's girlfriends, they would come. It was always the same chair, same pose, same lighting, you know? Which, in retrospect, was, you know, very... Like Andy Warhol, Andy Andy Warhol. yes. Warhol. Very Andy Warhol, <laughs> yes. knowing it. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I was a little older, you know, maybe 10 or 11, I got the, 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 the humongous VHS uh, camera. And, uh, you know, I used to call it the submarine monster. That was the nickname I gave to it. It was <laughs> huge. And I, you know, I would make little movies. And, you know, one that was funny was my, my grandmother, again, you know, clearly, you know, my grandmothers were important for Did me. your grandmother from your mother's my side? My mother's side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was well-to-do, and she had a house out in the country, and she would pick up stray dogs from the street, right? And mm -hmm. take them home and, you know, take care of them. And she had up to 70, 75 dogs, you know, at a certain point. And she had built fences. So I made this uh, documentary, you know, this fake documentary of her as the warden of a maximum security prison for dogs. <laughs> Where, you know, they were taken never to be seen again. You know, and I would do this, like, you know, long shots, you know, like from the woods, you know. And I had, you know, the, the, this man that, you know, would help her farming the land, you know. And I would say, okay, now you have to say this. And he's like, Emanuele, you're going to get me in trouble. I'm like, no, look, you have to do it. It's very important. Action. <laughs> and he would be, this lady is completely crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, did you take any school class, or you are a self, uh, self taught person in terms of uh, making movies? You know, I didn't take any creative classes per se, mm. but I tried to, you know, throughout the years to read anything, you know, uh, also technical that was about the topics I was interested in. So, photography, creative writing, filmmaking. And, uh, you know, I was lucky I had a few great mentors. You know, one of them was my. Uh, history teacher slash librarian in boarding school, mm -hmm. and he really initiated me to, uh, you know, great American literature like you know the Beat Generation, the New Journalism, mm -hmm. and to the great musicians like Miles Davis and Sonny Rollins, and you know the 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 sixties in New York, right, mm -hmm. and you know the folk music as well. So you know, thirty years later. You know, I live in the village, I read the same stuff and listen to the same stuff. So clearly, you know, he made a, a mark on me. And we're still best friends, so that's a good thing. And uh, a big hello to Tom Wolfe, by the way, talking yes. about, you know, yes. uh, speaking about new journalism. Yeah. And uh, when did you start working for Todd? Well, the very first job that I had was when I was 14 years old, and I failed my school year miserably. So my <laughs> father shit me off this factory that he has up in the mountains. So I spent the better part of the summer of 1990 packing, packing boxes. Okay. My grandfather would drive me up there, you know, at 5 a.m. I would do the work and then he would drive me back home. And then my and other... The, 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 the last year you, you know, you pass all the exams and of course, I mean, you became a very good student. I learned, I, oh I, yes, I learned. Yeah, you learned a lesson. <laughs> and he kept me there until my grandmother, this time, you know, my, or his mom, intervened, basically telling him that he was a criminal <laughs> to put this kid through that, you know? And so I got my couple of weeks of holiday as well, yeah. you know? Mm. Then but that you was, learned the lesson. Mm. Yeah. And then was, you know, like really the, the, the first, you know, really experience that I had, you know? Then uh, in 94, I moved to San Diego in California and I did a, a big, 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 in general, specifically for, you know, a 19-year-old guy a big project with the America's Cup and uh, uh, promotion of this line of shoes that my family made. And S the name of the shoe? The, the they were the called the Todd's Boat Competition. <laughs> you know, they still make them, but they were launched that year. 
So, I mean, it was a pretty fabulous job because, you know. Of course. I was all day on a boat and in a big house entertaining clients yeah. and the press, you know. Yeah. And, uh, working is something different. Yeah, uh, working is something <laughs> different. I found out later. <laughs> yes. You know, later that year. Later on, yes. Yeah. And, and um, yes, no, go ahead. And so you know that that was that was the the you know the, the first project which took about a year. Then I moved to Hong Kong. I worked for George Armani for about a year. Then I moved here to New York, and I've stayed ever since. I worked one year at Vogue magazine. I was the assistant to the publisher, and then I started working, you know, for Todd's mm -hmm. full time, and started you know with the focus on, you know, the creative side of the business and the advertising campaigns, you know. Yes. And, and in uh, fact, let's watch some something that he did in the um, you know in the early years at the at Tots. this is the first campaign that you were involved with yeah. and uh, the photographer is Michelle, Michelle. Comte and uh, this is another very simple but interesting still life that you conceived with Giovanni Gastel this is you on the set Tim of Walker. this yes this uh, Fay uh, campaign. This is um, uh, Peter Lindbergh, who did this wonderful Admiral Valletta shot for uh, Todd's again. So you work with great um, photographers, at least you know all you know through your ears at Todd's, but especially at the beginning. So what did I mean, tell us about the experience that you have with them? You know, it's mostly learning about that specific genre that the photographer was doing at that time because clearly they do a lot of different things right mm -hmm. so i can only speak for the takeaway of those specific projects sure with you know with michelle with the ines sastre and the and the, and the let's McDowell, go back yes you know it was all about you know a f Andy uh, McDowell. The, the idea of uh, a formal female beauty mm -hmm. you know, a beauty that yeah. is uh, you know very much you know like ines sastre you know styled in, in very much a a European way, okay, and there's a formality to it. You know, with Tim Walker, it's completely different because everything is a whimsical folly, mm -hmm. and so he would, uh, you know, take elements from a British city and put them in the British countryside, and then he would take the countryside and bring them indoor. You know, and he's really like, you know, he's, a, he's I would say, you know, he's a master of fantasy right? mm -hmm. and a terrific yes. guy, which makes you know the work work there, easier, yeah, much more pleasant. Mm -hmm. You know, with Peter, you know, I was, you know, I only was able to work with him once, which you know, I wish I had more. You know, it's, you know, for him, it's all about the, the, the intensity and not the formality, but the intensity of the female beauty, mm -hmm. you know, captured in an instant, right? I think this is a good example mm -hmm. of that. And, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, with every photographer, you know, there has always been, you know, a great learning curve, you mm -hmm. know. You know, I could go on and on. I know after we're talking about other photographers, yes. directors, so the, the, you know they also brought you know other. Uh, the uh, the pros and the cons of uh, working in a f you know for a family business. Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on, tell us something. I think look, I worked you know for my family half of my time, mm -hmm. half of my life, and uh, you know it's at times extremely fulfilling. A, because you help your family. B, because if they trust you, they give you great creative freedom of mm -hmm. doing things. And, uh, you know, at other times when you put, you know, three, you know, Italian boys with strong ideas in a, an enclosed The three space. boys are the father, the Diego, uncle. the the uncle, yeah. Andrea, and... Uh, and me. And him is quite temperamental as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it kind of feels a bit like, you know, three gladiators stuck in a, in, in, in a broom <laughs> closet, you know? <laughs> like something is bound to explode, right? But, you know, it is also a learning curve. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I, I think if somebody is lucky that can, you know, afford it, it's always good, you know, if somebody works for his family half of his life and then the other half goes off and does his own thing. Yes. You know? Yeah. Like you're doing now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've been doing it for a while, yeah. you know? I think it's... Um, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Uh, in 2003, uh, Emanuele decided to launch Formapura. Formapura um, w uh, was an advertising and event project agency which had collaborated with the top luxury brands uh, worldwide 
including, apart from Tots and Roger Vivier, which are part of the family business, also with the BMW, Tory Burch, Sack Fifth Avenue, and the magazine Wallpaper. So why did you decide to open your own agency? So we created this agency. By the way, Eva, who's sitting here, was the CEO of the agency for a long time, so we did a lot of cool stuff together. Welcome. And it was a way, you know, for me personally to broaden my horizons and look at other things that were different than just, you know, fashion accessories at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And uh, I thought it was very beneficial for Todd's as well because, you know, we created this lean machine, you know, uh, 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 parallel but independent from the day-to-day -day management. So it was small, it was fast, we did things all over the world very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, you know, it was a great advantage for both. Certainly, you know, we, we did, I think, our, you know, I did my best work, you know, for Todd's when, you know, when I was on my own with this agency. And, you know, the way I saw it, you know, liking the, the, the movie business, you know, I th always thought of it as, and that's the way I pitched it actually to my family, that it was going to be sort of an independent production company okay, in mm -hmm. the studio lot yes. that was Todd's, and Todd's could have first look at everything I was working in, right? And, and then, mm. you know, so it, it, was, uh, it was interesting, it was very cool, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, in, when you uh, studied Formapura and during your tenure at Formapura, you uh, conceived a lot of uh, advertising campaign. So which are the guidelines in conceiving, first of all, in general, the, an advertising campaign and the, the ingredients to make an advertising campaign successful? I mean, uh, you know, I don't think from your point of view. As a formula, I think actually when mm -hmm. you go into formulaic territory, you know, it may be detrimental. I think you should start by asking yourself very simple questions. Which are? Again, going back to the DNA of the brand. What is the DNA of the brand? And does it need to be fine-tuned? Do you need an evolution or do you need a revolution? Who is this brand good at talking to, right? Who is your mm -hmm. audience, essentially? Do you want to keep that audience? Do you want to expand? Do you want to differentiate? I think these are, you know, really the main questions. You know, once you answer those questions, I think the trick, you know, like in a, you know, like in a, in a, in a, in a basketball team, you know, a coach should hire great athletes, give them the ball, and let them run with it. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Um, that say is not is not that easy. And uh, for instance, when we talk about thoughts, tell us the the DNA of uh, thoughts. And uh, in order to then eventually understand a little bit better some campaigns yeah. that you yeah. look if conceived. you move on to the next slide, yes. I think it could be a good example. Okay, you know? this is a very <coughs> very success was a very successful advertising campaign. This was uh, two thousand and eight. Yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow shot by Mario Testino, Testino in Capri. Yes. So, you know, we wanted to take these two, you know, genetic block of thoughts that were very important. First, you know, you have uh, uh, an actress, a famous actress, beautiful, who has that sort of, uh, you know, preppy background, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, Todd's really embraced, especially at the beginning, you know, the first advertising my father did where, you know, with uh, Jack Kennedy and Jackie O sailing in a Yanni sport. So mm -hmm. you get a lot of that, uh, you know, I would want to say waspy, feeling. northeastern mm -hmm. feeling. <clears throat> and we took her to Capri, which is also another, you know, breeding ground for the brand. Which we don't see here, but doesn't matter. Yeah. We see a wonderful boat. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I should thank uh, Testino for not seeing Capri. Mm. But uh, anyway, <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, and it was, you know, going to this place where, <coughs> you know, the brand sort of uh, has so grown bad. throughout the years because, mm -hmm. you know, there is, uh, you know, it's Italian, but it's cosmopolitan. It's very chic, but it's also very casual. Mm -hmm. You know, these are, the, I would say, if you ask what, what are the DNA ingredients of Todd's, those are, you know. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have also a kind of feeling of uh, the talented Mr. Ripley. I always thought of the yeah. talented Mr. Ripley when I... When I first, yeah, especially this photo. Yes, yeah. Yeah. when I when I got the uh, the image and uh, it's much more contemporary. This 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 story, this this advertising campaign was done a couple of years probably after Mr. Ripley, so it, it a resonated. Longer. Yeah. A longer. Uh, it's interesting to see that the year after you did this campaign, so in two thousand and nine. 
you <coughs> took a total different direction and you collaborated instead with a fashion photographer with one of the most famous uh, magnum agency giant, Elliot Irving. And uh, so what happened and uh, why this choice and uh, why this black and white campaign in the countryside? Yeah. I mean, we had a wonderful, famous actress in, uh, you know, by the sea I, just a year before, and now we have a total change of, uh, of path. You know, the financial crisis hit right at the time that I was shooting Gwyneth. So I went back to Todd's a few months after, said, okay, you know, what do you guys want me to do? They're like, you know what, just keep doing everything that you're doing, do whatever you want, as long as you take away a zero from the budget. Okay? So, okay, and so, so what is the story that you wanted to address so, you know, as, here? As they say, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention, and <laughs> uh, I called my old friend, Elliot, who, you know, has been a dear friend for a long time. He came and photographed, you know, my, uh, my wedding, you know, uh, our wedding, and... Uh, uh, how did you meet him? Elliot. Mm. I met through, I met him through an Italian uh, woman who was an art curator and mm -hmm. uh, she brought him to Italy for an exhibit and we were seated at dinner together and we just had a good time and you know, we kept in touch and became friends. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Elliot Irvin and uh, he uh, was a very famous fashion journalist like Kappa and Deidre Steichen and uh, he was part of the Magnum Agency agency in Paris, and uh, he, um, his reportages on the Korea conflict in the 50s were very seminal, and he also worked a lot in Europe and the US, photographing leaders, political leaders like Che Guevara, or uh, the, Pope. the Pope, and uh, Marilyn Monroe, and uh, common people. So his work was very, very seminal. For the people who love photograph and uh, photojournalism, is one of the biggest yeah. name. And you know, he's, he's an old guy that walks around with a Leica, and that's it. So, you know, Testino also has a small camera, but he has 50 people traveling with him. <laughs> it was uh, Elliot, was him and I, and everything was very light. You know, we went to you know sort of fabulous people's homes. So tell us the uh, the, the 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 message or and the story that you wanted to tell through, you know, these images. Look, I mean, in the other, in, sorry, in the other um, uh, advertising campaign, we had a story of this lovely lady who happened also to be an actress on a boat. So wealthiness, preppiness, you know, waspiness, you name them. Here you have a black and white guy playing with the dog. Who is this guy? He's a guy that, okay, First of all, specifically the name of this guy. I we don't, don't know, but, <laughs> but uh, you know there were other. You know there was Lauren yes. Remington Platt. This is India Hicks. Yes, in and a, the, uh, a family yes. estate mm. in England. So you know I wanted to get first of all real people, mm -hmm. like, but so, not real people like commoners, you know, like, the, <laughs> like you know, like a be people. better version than ourselves, <laughs> right? Let's say famous and, people. I mean, or aristocrats, or yeah. you know, and uh, I wanted it interesting to be, people and I all over it the world. Very <laughs> cozy, you know, because it was the spirit of the time where, you know, necessary ostentations of wealth was out, mm -hmm. right? And uh, So you yeah. photographed them in their house? Yeah. It was a very, you know, so these are, you know, boys and girls that go out very often. So I could tell them, you know, do your own makeup just like you're going out for dinner with your girlfriends. So okay. It was also a way to, you know. A nice, uh, nice way to save right? money. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the styling was also very much like, hey, go in and pick a few amongst, you know, this clothing. And it was a wonderful experience, you know, just traveling. You know, we went to, we did one in Southampton, we did one in Italy, in London, this Lauren Remington mm -hmm. Platt, right? Who was yes. a friend of Antonio and she's from New York. So I, I thought it, you know, captured quite well the the um, you know the essence of that specific time. and actually the interesting thing is that they are not posing with a, a bag that he gave them they are posing with the bag that they own so they are are photographed with a thoughts bag that they actually own so it's nice because for instance this one is you can see that is slightly used it's not brand new so this is a very interesting spirit of the campaign Okay, so working with Todd, you also had the chance to collaborate with visionary talents, many visionary talents, and one of them was uh, 
Dennis Hopper, who was not only a great actor, but was also a very talented uh, director and uh, photographer. I find it a bit distracting when people come in late, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, um, it's clear that you don't recognize Dennis Hopper in these photographs because he's out of focus, but he really loves this photograph, and he asked me specifically to use it instead of the one, which is better, that I found on the internet. It's so, more iconic. I okay. mean, it's like... Your through, dad, you, through and Dennis, Dennis Hopper. Okay, through Dennis, help. I had commissioned Dennis Hopper, Damien Hurst, and Ed Ruscha to make paintings, right, that were going to be turned into bags for Hogan, right? And not, uh, not, yeah, no, uh, not we're bad. Talking, we're talking yes. about, you know, I would say 12 years ago, but mm -hmm. we're all, you know, the art intersect, the intersection of art and fashion, fashion wasn't that, you know, exploited mm -hmm. as it's been since. And, you know, that was in Los Angeles. Uh, we went together. I was there. And my father also joined for what, you know, probably we were opening a shop. And so we went with Dennis at Ed's, studio mm -hmm. and this is the photo and my uncle is also there when we were looking at the bag i mean i'd seen them but they had the it. nose on the very left is That's andrea's uncle, nose yes. mm. and we you know it was the, f the first time that they actually got to see the, those bags mm -hmm. you know so so i mean it was emotional mm -hmm. for me you know of so course so uh when did you meet him dennis. when did you meet dennis i met dennis in 94 because he was in rome promoting a film and i was uh, still i'm good friends with his uh, some days good friends, some days not, with his daughter, Marin, mm -hmm. and uh, she was the fashion director of Elle magazine back then. We would hang out you know, in the business here in New York. Sure. So I was in Italy. She said, look, my father is there. I think you guys would really hit it off. You know, why don't you get together? So, you know, I had to meet him for dinner. Essentially, we stayed, like, in Rome one week, hanging out day and night. You know, we would, like, walk in the streets, and he photographed walls. So, you know, he had a big cigar, and he would always, like, you know, run to the walls and, like, take pictures, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, and we became dear friends, and then you know we did a lot of uh, you know projects. And what kind of project did you do together? A lot of things. You know, exhi I exhibited his uh, photography all over the world uh, by themselves and in conjunction with the big fashion book that came out, you know, ju just before he passed. Mm -hmm. And then in between, uh, we uh, did a short film together. You know, Dennis had a uh, you know was much older than me, but he had this childlike enthusiasm, well, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, for ideas, mm -hmm. you know. I remember, you know, one night, one day for me in Europe, you know, there was this opportunity to do something in Tokyo, and so I called him, you know, in the middle of the night, and he picks up, and I'm like, Dennis, you know, that there is this thing that we can do in Tokyo, you know, and you know, he had this nasal Midwestern accent, he's like, ah, oh, Tokyo, man, oh, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, do you want to do it? It's like, yeah, man, let's go to Tokyo. And he, he was just enthusiastic, you know, for things. You know, it was beautiful. Uh, I would like to show you, uh, Julian, if you can project the, um, the Dennis Hopper video. Uh, Dennis Hopper for Toads uh, wrote and direct uh, a video, a promotional video with Gwyneth Paltrow that you um, uh, produced. So let's watch it. And the video actually went to Cannes Film Festival in 2008. So it was a, I know, seen create it quite since. a sensation. Yes. Do you mind if I record this interview? No, that's fine, no? yeah. Okay. So, you are here for this big party, no? Yes, the rap party for the film. Yes. Wow. Please, uh, uh, stop with this. Yeah, this is too much. I can't. Winner. Winner, please, your bag. Winner, your bag. Winner, your bag. Winner. 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 Winner.
it, you know. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was the first time that Dennis directed anything in a very long time. He kind of indulged himself a little bit in the editing room, but you know what? He was so happy. That's fine, you know. And I like the the Cinderella, you know, idea that Cinderella got back, you know, got the the shoes back, and uh, Gwyneth got the bag but, back. Uh, it was like you know, Cinderella meets La Dolce Vita. La Dolce Vita. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, apart from uh, uh, Dennis Hopper, another great uh, visionary talent that you work with was Dante Ferretti. Dante Ferretti, the Oscar winner set designer, and uh, who worked a lot for uh, Fellini and Pasolini, and uh, he worked with you. Scorsese. Scorsese, yes, of course. Of, of course. Tim, Burton. Tim Burton. And uh, he's from Macerata, which is not irrelevant. <laughs> which is very close to where I he's from. from. Manuel is from. So, or for you, he work. I mean, he designed a lot of sets for different um, uh, events, including uh, the windows of the store, the top store here on Madison Avenue in New York. And here we have some photographs of the uh, of the circus team that he conceived yeah. for. No, this is another one. Okay, for for the windows. So. Um, uh, how did you uh, meet uh, Dante, and uh, what did you learn from him? I know Dante from really being from the same town and seeing him around. And then I approached him one time where I wanted to make uh, a reinterpretation of the sets of the films that really inspired Todd's. So which are? Which were? There, there was from Barefoot in the Park, we recreated the plaza, we the getaway, mm -hmm. right, with Steve McQueen and Ali Negro. We did uh, <coughs> Blow Up. We did uh, Pulp <laughs> Fiction, The Dance Floor, and a couple of others. You mm -hmm. know, it was very, it was big, big scale project. I mean, it was big. And, uh, you know, what he really taught me was more something that has to do with, um, you know, with filmmaking, which is you know, essentially, it's a story told in a confined space, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's a small room or it's John Ford's desert, it's still a confined, limited space. Mm -hmm. And uh, within that space, you have a camera that may or may not move, right? Pasolini never moves, Bertolucci is always moving, right? Mm -hmm. And a set of actors that float or not in this space and tell the story. You know, if you break it down, it's pretty essential, <laughs> you know? And it's, again, I'm drawn from uh, these people because usually I found in my life, you know, the more, you know, uh, uh, genial and intelligent they are, the simpler they are, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, what is the, uh, the set design that Dante Ferretti uh, conceived that you like the most? Well, we did the circus event which then mm -hmm. was transported into you know windows for the for the shop shops and um, I thought that was interesting you know you were asking me the other day you know what you know sometimes there's not really a huge idea behind you know it was mm -hmm. a time that I don't even remember when we did this but you know it, it was about having fun and uh, you know being light mm -hmm. right and going back to things that we loved when we were kids and so, you know, again, there is the Italian connection of the circus, there is the Fellini connection, right? Yes. So it was just beautiful. You know, you have to think, you know, we make a window. You have to think of a woman that walks the block on Madison Avenue. She has uh, three seconds looking left. And either you capture her or you don't. She's going to move on. So I think this was pretty high mm -hmm. catching, you know? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, on sets, you uh, and working for Todd's, you not you not only you met set designers, photographers, artists, and so on. You also met uh, what who, the 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 lady who became the woman of your life, and uh, the wife, and uh, the mother of your three children, and uh, is Joanna who is here, and we say hi to her, yes. and. Uh, and this is the event, look. Yep. So the event where you finally met Joanna. So tell us about well, it. We knew each other before. <laughs> we knew each other before. I tried to be charming, not very successfully. And then uh, we met again. And um, Joanna was working at Interview Magazine, which 
yes. the fashion director. She was the interview. fashion director of magazine uh, interview mag magazine interview is uh, still uh, a, a very interesting publication and was launched in the 70s by Henry Warhol. Yeah. And back then there were still Sandy Brandt and, and Ingrid Sishi. You know, which, uh, you know, I love the interview as it is now. Yes, as but well. when they were there, it was a different. It was different, it was yeah, different absolutely. But game, yes, know? absolutely. And uh, so they introduced me like properly to John. Huh? And uh, the project that we did, you know, I knew that the design office of Todd's <laughs> was doing a pop inspired collection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, interview and the Warhol. You know, the nickname of the interview is the Crystal Ball of Pop back yes. then. Yeah. So we did this exhibit of all the coolest interview covers throughout the years. And also, I remember we contacted the museum in Pittsburgh, so I got Andy Warhol's wig and <coughs> got Andy Warhol's camera, and we put it together in this exhibit, which was, you know, very well liked. And then you proposed. I think that was before. Is that before? Yeah. It was before. Okay. <laughs> but that's good. Anyway, okay. Uh, that's nice. Um, so this is the infamous D bag, is the, uh, the bag that Todd's designed and dedicated to Lady, mm, Lady Diana. It was the first bag that Todd's ever made, actually. All right, that's even more interesting. So uh, what actually I would like to point out now is that you, uh, with Formapura, in 2010, came up with an app for an iPad, and uh, that was one of the first ever conceived Actually, by... The very, a, the very first. conceived by a brand. So yeah, an app, a luxury, a luxury brand. brand, an app for iPad. And um, the app that you conceived was uh, called um, My Life in, uh, is My in, life this is bag. in This Bag. And we can see some photographs yeah. So of the app and to get, tell did, me the uh, story yeah hmm. you know the story a lot of people you know say you know it was a homage to irving penn mm -hmm. not be even homage i ripped off irving penn and <laughs> with uh, his famous photograph which is called theater accident which is this bag that spills the content yes okay, of a woman that you can clearly think see that you are that she is at the opera because of the content so, you know, there is that voyeuristic component, right? So I said, you know, why don't we take, you know, five or six different girls and we photograph the, the, the contents, the spill out of, our ba of their bags, and each of the items is interactive. So if there was a passport, you would go in, I think that was China Chow, and you would see where she had traveled, you know, the stamps mm -hmm. that she had in the past six months, right? And then uh, there was, uh, you know, a note. This is, yes, this is the passport. Yeah. And then, you know, there was a, a notebook where she was a mom and she would jot down the recipes with her kids, another one. Yes, this is the, the recipe. Yeah. You know, there, there were all sorts of, like, things that were, you know, a little gimmicky but fun. Mm -hmm. you know? And my life is in this bag comes, you know, from the phrase that usually, you know, the, the, the boys tell the girls when the girl is like, you know, hold this bag for me. And you're like, God, what do you keep in there? Right. right? <laughs> they say, and my life the is in this is bag, like, yes. Hey, my, you know, shut up, man. My life is in this bag, right? <laughs> The last um, work that you did for Thoughts was a video that you wrote and directed last year. This is the poster. It's called Harvest Moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an interesting love story. Let's watch it, and uh, then we will, you know, discuss it a little bit. So, Tom, tell us something about you. Taxi! I'm just uh, roaming around for a bit, taking a sabbatical from London. Oh, oh! Bloody hell! How do you like the island so far? It's incredible. I'm not from here. Really? Tell me where I can stay. It's a charming little place. Here's the deal. You help me with dinner and I'll give you a room in my guest house. One night only. What do you think of the food, though? I think it was great. Yeah? I think we got away with it, didn't we? Yeah. What a sky, huh? It's incredible. You know, painters and writers have been coming here for thousands of years. They all agree that a funny thing happens to time, Capri. Time, they say, becomes a variable. Time 
become suspended somewhere between the sea and the sky. And there it lingers forever. I love you too. Bye. Very nice. And back to Capri with a different, you know, spirit. So what did you want to, you know, what did you have in mind when you wrote this, 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 this short movie? You know, usually there is the typical structure of a, a cinematic love story. Usually goes the foreign, American ingenue, mm -hmm. comes to Italy and falls in love with a Marcello Mastroianni type <laughs> of uh, guy. I wanted to turn it upside down and instead have, you know, the British male ingenue mm -hmm. that goes to Capri and meets this, you know, super beautiful and cool and strong woman and kind of like, you know, doesn't know what the hell hit him. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I thought it was, uh, I had a lot of fun making this. Also, you know, the location. The location, know, yeah, hurt, exactly, you know? exactly. Um, what is the, uh, in your mind, the, the, the future of... Um, advertising in the digital age you know, and I, how eventually change the, uh, the the advertising in the digital age you know I think there it's so fragmented today mm -hmm. in the sense that you have so much content out there you have so many fl platforms you know to absorb this content the attention span has become razor thin mm -hmm. so I think the most important thing whatever you do is immediacy you know I had three seconds to hook you Okay, and if I don't, well, probably I've lost you. You know, I had a meeting at Instagram recently, and you know, you can go up to I think to 60 seconds of videos that mm -hmm. you can post on Instagram. And uh, the woman who was in charge of the division told me, but look, my advice is never do anything above 10, okay? And if you can, stay within three seconds, okay? So I mean, you know, you, you need to come up with a new grammar and a new, you know, narrative, right? Mm -hmm. To hook, you know, that kind of, you know, mostly I would say millennial. I think we're still used to different rhythms, you know, we can... Uh, I definitely, I am, you know, yeah. not even a centennial. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm Jurassic. Yeah. I'm Jurassic. No. Yeah, so I don't even know, more or less know what Instagram is. So, no, please, no. Yeah. Uh, you, it's, it's true. Um, you also, I, I, I was asked able to. Another question before, which yes. was, uh, w which we didn't touch on, but you know, you were saying, how do you conceive an advertising campaign? Right? Yes. And you know, I think that the most important thing is to do your homework, right? Yeah. And uh, to really get the references right. And when you actually create, it's very important, you know, they say the ability to conceal your creative sources is as important as good ideas. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, you know, to do a substantial research, you know, if you lived in, in Milan or even more so in a small town, you know, you would have to fly to London, dig through bookstores, stay there for three or four days. You know, today, you know, you can do uh, this without leaving the sofa, you know, through all, you know, the internet and Instagram, right? And I think, you know, it's a great thing because, you know, it's essential, it's, uh, you know, th there is democracy in access to information that before were for privileged people, you know, like myself. Yeah. Same thing with photography, you know, you wanted to take great photos, you need that knowledge. Yes, it's also true, yes, it's also true that for me sometimes democracy is a, you know, is a, is an interesting word that uh, more of the, you know, I would say also sometimes it leads to anarchy. I mean, because you have so many uh, stimulus and so many images and so many, um, things that you can access to that you don't understand sometimes yeah. and you don't know what to pick and what to choose yeah, well, and what the, to believe you know, also. You, yeah. you, need a, you need to have a good eye as, you know, editors yes. have. And, uh, of course. You know, you need to have some self-restraint in all the amount of mm -hmm. stuff that you can look at, right? Yeah. And, you know, it killed a little bit the romance in the sense that, you know, the underground, yeah. what was then underground is now mainstream two hours after its yes, inception, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, Mm. A lot of people have access. I think mm. that's a good thing. Yes. Yeah? Oh, yes, absolutely. 
you also experimented in digital media. And in 2012, here, here you are with your friend Francesco Carozzini, who's here tonight. And Francesco is another great friend and is a very talented photographer and uh, Film. a filmmaker. Uh, so you both uh, conceived and launched Lifestyle Mirror. And uh, Lifestyle Mirror was an innovative um, e-commerce website. Yeah. And uh, let's watch a little bit of uh, how you wanted to <coughs> present the merchandising in a very creative way, because it looked like a magazine first, right? Yeah. And uh, what did you put in there? You know, also the, to be you know, to be said is how important Francesco's mom, Franca, was mm -hmm. in giving us, you know, incredibly precious advice, you know. Franca, Franca was Franca Sozzani, uh, who was the late editor of uh, Italian Vogue. Yeah. And, you know, what we wanted to do was a magazine that didn't exist back then, that had the quality of print, right, mm -hmm. as you can see from the photographs. Yes. That had the variety of a department store, and where everything was for sale. So... As you can see, you know, you would scroll around the photographs and there would be pop-ups of the tuxedo, okay? Mm -hmm. And we would sell you not only the tuxedo that he had, but another five in different shapes and price points, right? Including, you know, the decor, right? Yes. And if they were on a beach, you could buy a package from the hotel. I mean, it was something yes. extremely... Ambitious. Yes, it and the was, uh, for instance, in this case, also the photographers and all the accessories that and all the uh, the, the, the 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 furniture that you have in this sale. in this particular photograph. Yeah. And um, so it was beautiful. It was extremely oh, well received. Yes. There and was he is uh, Daniel. By, by the way, the, the guy yeah. is Daniel de la Falaise. Daniel de la Falaise is a chef. Yeah. Is the chef who did the the catering service for Kate Moss um, wedding. Uh, wedding, and is the, uh, the the brother of uh, Lucy de la Falaise, who is married to Keith Richards' son, and they both are the uh, very famous people in fashion in our world in fashion industry because the, the uh, their aunt was mm -hmm. Lulu de la Falaise, who was uh, uh, one of the muse of uh, Yves Saint Laurent. So uh, back then, um, so everything was uh, for sale, yeah. and um, you know production values through the roof. We would shoot everywhere in the world. You know what I mean? Yes, and also you also not only you did uh, photo shooting, and every day or every over three or four days you change the merchandising and the contents, but you also did videos. Yeah. Right. Yeah, video content. Video content. Yeah, a lot of video content. Uh, I would like to show you. Two very short videos that he did. One on Daphne Guinness. Daphne Guinness is this lady who opened that was the, the, the you know the first guest of Lifestyle Mirror. Daphne Guinness is from the Guinness family, and she's a mm, very a very a, a fashion icon. But not only that, um, Daphne Guinness is a fashion connoisseur. She is the one who knows everything about couture, and she's the one who also bought. The, uh, the entire wardrobe of Isabella Blow, who was uh, um, a fashion editor, who was also the muse and uh, the talent scout of uh, the late Alexander McQueen. So Daphne Guinness is, uh, is a talented woman with a lot of um, interest and uh, a keen uh, passion for fashion, but a real passion, not only for clothes itself, but for the history of fashion. So Julian, can you please... Um, show the uh, Daphne Guinness and, and that very other, uh, another uh, short movies on uh, Chiara Ferragni, who, when you did, was a young influencer and now is the number one influencer of the world. So, very short one. Okay, please, thank you. I find rock music works in English, but uh, opera really, it's Italian, it's French, it's German. 
if you see a piece of music, if, uh, if you see it in colours and fractals, it's, um, it's extraordinary because you can really see where it's going and you can see where the sound is. You, you know how you can, you'll suddenly, some, something will suddenly make sense to you. I'm hoping that free jazz or Bjork or some of them, so some of that will make sense because I'm, I'm a 60s person really. I like the Beatles and the Stones and Jefferson Airplane and David Bowie. I am reading um, Philip K. Dick, Ex Jesus. It's actually kind of amazing. The, uh, the, f the book about Fibonacci, which is great. And also I'm reading a book about translation. I am re reading a book about, um, it's very boring, it's about calculus. And I don't know much about fashion. I mean, I, I glide around the edges of the industry. I'm not really in the industry. Not I know what I knows. can put on and what, what, I, what I can't. I, I can't look at prints. Oh, and, I, and, and, and sort of, um, I, I like um, old sequins. I veer towards something simple that I can, so that it, even if the jacket is 20 years old, you can just put it with another shirt and it's fine. You know, but you, you know I just sort of, narrowed it down to that. Hello, I'm Chiara Ferragni from thedonsala.com and welcome to my room for New York Fashion Week. Here we have a very small closet which is all packed with some of my clothes and party dresses for Fashion Week. I usually start from one item, so for example, this skirt. I decided to match it with the blonde salad. Okay, it's very short. So, um, so from people that are not strictly in the fashion world, as you can see, people in fashion are not exactly normal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, let, I would like also to show when we're going to be able to go back to, yes. Um, apart from the, uh, the Lifestyle Mirror experiment, you launched immediately after Elizabeth Street. Yeah. Elizabeth Street was another experiment that you did, and there was a, a, a place where mom could talk. It was a community of cool moms from all over so, the world. So, yes, how, right? how, did you, how did the idea come about? It came about from, you know, again, a simple observation, which was, you know, the affluence of all the moms in New York, but also in London and in Paris. You know, there was a sort of a second baby boom in those years. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, I could tell, like, moms really wanted to share their experiences, you know, what to do with the kids, what to do with their husband when the kids was not around, where to shop, you know what I mean, for more functional clothes, mm -hmm. but they were also, you know, sexy and make them feel good, you know? And so we came up with this idea of, uh, instead of us producing the content, like we did for Lifestyle Mirror, to actually coordinate content that would come from these moms. So mm -hmm. essentially, we created, we created a platform of, a forum. Like mm. hundreds, mm. right? Of moms. And 800 moms all over the world. So it was, you know, it was before geolocation. Mm -hmm. Because I think that if there was geolocation when we started, you know, things would have uh, grown, grown ex you know, exponentially. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was very good. It was very well received. We had the best clients in the luxury goods that, you know, they love the specificity of the target, mm -hmm. you know. And what happened to this, you, the, uh, these two things? To, uh, media uh, band. Me yes. You know, to what happened is that, you know, I really think we were for sure three years ahead of our time, which is, sounds cool, but it's just as bad as being three years late, mm -hmm. you know? And it was extremely expensive <laughs> to run for the quality that we wanted to give. And uh, personally, my fault was to believe more in an advertising-based revenue model as opposed to an e-commerce model, mm -hmm. okay? So that was, you know, I, I would say, you know, the, 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 the fundamental mistake that I personally made in there. And, uh, you know, it was at the time that, you know, in order to, we really had to double down on an investment that was already very substantial. 
And so we just say, you know what, let's move on. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. You know, we put some of the pieces of the company at good work because, for example, Todd's bought the whole back end for their own e-commerce. So, so yes. You know, there was, you know, wasn't just, you know, w wasted. But, you of know, course. it could have been... Uh, from a creative point of view, it was absolutely interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really like it, especially Lifestyle Miller was uh, a big, you know, it was very ahead of the time, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, your work uh, was recognized by many uh, magazines, uh, many, you know, international magazines. Is there a, a story that they wrote on you that you are particularly proud of? <laughs> Look at him, yeah. Uh, youth. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh, I mean, look, it's, they're all f very flattering, you know, the mm -hmm. fact that, like, you know, I had a lot of articles at a certain time in Hong Kong, so when I would go and visit, you know, there is a big fashion community there, and, like, you know, people are like, you know, oh, you're the guy, you know, it was yesterday in the newspaper, you know, it's kind of flattering, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I think the trick is that if you love to see yourself in the press, you have a problem, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> You, 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 you should, you know, really work with the press when you have something to promote, which is bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. This is my you opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and recently, you decided to say goodbye to it all. I mean, to say goodbye to the fashion industry, to the fashion world. And you decided to concentrate on writing and uh, directing uh, feature movies. Yeah. Last year, you debuted with Wetlands. As I, yeah, <coughs> you know, it's not a recent thing. You know, I've always wanted to make films, and I think that sort of a organic evolution of the storytelling that I've been doing for the last twenty years, you know, brought me to do essentially the same thing with completely different topics and a different length. Yes, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, doesn't really change much from what I was doing. You know. Mm, yes, but let's see. Okay, I would like to, you know, show you uh, the trailer of Wetlands, and think of uh, the the movie that he did with Wilfred Paltrow in Capri, and let's let's wa let's watch this one. Keep to yourself, mind your own business, because this is the last stop for you. Guys, this is my ex-husband, the police, the popo. Say hi. I moved here. I'm back on the force. Who are you, Savannah? I'm the rich girl you used to parade in front of your friends. Remember me? Your lover friend, you're stealing from a bunch of animals. Make your lady friend stop now. Do it for our daughter. My daughter's better off with me than with a deranged addict. Those days are part of the past. Do you know who I am? From Atlantic City, it's Catherine Buchanan. I wish a great night to you all. Senora T. Don't touch the wrong wire. You'll get burned. I turned a corner in my life. That girl, she's in big trouble. When I go down, you're coming down with me. You're the reason that my family's in danger. Reporters may come around and start asking questions. I told you it wasn't gonna end well. So, uh, a very tough film noir uh, set up in Atlantic City. So, tell us the um, the idea, of, uh, how the idea of wetlands um, take place. You know, we go in the summer, Joanna's family is from Philadelphia, so people from Philadelphia, they go, not necessarily to Atlantic City, but, you know, to the prettier, quainter part of the shore, 
like you know, New Yorkers go to Long Island. So mm -hmm. we've been going there for a long time. And I'm familiar with the places, including the ones that are not so pretty, like Atlantic City. And, you know, I've always been drawn to crime stories and, you know, noir fiction. And, uh, you know, it is a pretty bleak place, Atlantic City. Cinematically, is incredible because you have, you know, all these murals, the boardwalks, you know, and everything. <coughs> Everything is, you know, big and and shiny, but it's all falling apart. And you know, I come, uh, you know, I come very decadent, very decadent. Same, same. And you know, I say, you know, when people ask me what's it like, and you know, I always say, you know, it's where the American dream has gone to shit. Yes, you know? <laughs> basically, and, yes, yeah. I agree. And um, so I was drawn, you know, to come up with this, uh, you know, with the with the story of perdition and redemption, mm -hmm. and. Uh, spend a considerable amount of time doing my research. You know, I know every single cop and crook in Atlantic City, so <laughs> if you need a guide, call me. And uh, I'm actually going back <laughs> this summer to make a documentary. That, that we will I'll talk, talk about, about later, yeah. And so I, I just came up with these, you know, characters and story. I've sent out the script to a few people in Hollywood with a pseudonym, actually, with a fake name, right? Why? You know, I just wanted the truth. I didn't want kindness. You know, if I sent it to friends of mine, what were they going to say? Like, dude, sticks to shoes, you know? <laughs> so, so what kind <laughs> of uh, pen name you uh, decided to so use? So I, I used the name, which is Albert Pistot, and I sold him as a, as a washed-up Canadian guy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a spoof of my maternal grandfather's name, which is Alberto Pistilli. Uh, okay. So I did this, right? And then, uh, and then you know, my friends they gave me notes, and then I came clean. I said, "Look, you know, this is me." This is me. Yeah. And let's 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 see if we can. Um, what else uh, do you have? No, uh, I would like to. Yes, Julian, if we can switch to the um, to the uh, to to my to my computer, okay? Because this is. Uh, uh, Manuele in action, and this is the uh, the the poster of Wetlands with you know some good reviews from uh, the New York Times and other magazine because he the 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 movie uh, came out in the U.S. Uh, last year. Um, the criteria of uh, choosing the cast. I mean, uh, the only famous one is uh, Ether Graham. I mean, the, the famous Hollywood star, but mm -hmm. we have other great uh, actors that you... you know, Adewale, I found myself. Adewale you know, is the main the character. main character. And I found him myself, I went through, you know, I started on my own went going through lists of, you know, either uh, African-American or African-British actors, African-French that could play that part. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met with him and I, you know, we fell really for each other, you know. And uh, so that's he was number one in. The second one was Chris McDonald, mm -hmm. who one night I go to a party and I'm um, standing at the bar. And this I is at the Wale. Mm -hmm. That's at the Wale. And I see him and I'm like, you know, this is, this is the character that I'm writing, you know? And I didn't tell him anything, but then I reached out to him the following day, sent him the script, and he loved it. Jennifer Healy, who is, you know, three times Tony winner, you know, she's a master of the stage. Mm -hmm. She read the script, the agent. Jennifer Neely is the, 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 the lady that the you have, you, you've seen, the, 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 the anchor woman. The next one. Yes. That one. Yeah. Next one. And, um, you know, she really pushed to have this part. She really loved mm -hmm. it, you know. And uh, so I found her, and then I needed, uh, you know, I needed a star. So, you know, you know some are available, some are not. Either I thought it was interesting because usually she plays comedy very well, but after I met, I knew that she has some drama and some darkness in mm -hmm. her, and I think she did. She she got amazing reviews. You know? And she yes, and she plays the the strange wife yeah. of uh, um, the the cop, and yeah. uh, also that I mean she the strange wife. And the fact that she, uh, she became a lesbian and uh, the, um, yeah, and the, the girl, girl. Her new girlfriend, Surfer Girl, that's the name yes. of the character. She's an amazing, amazing actress. And, you know, I found that they had a very good casting director here and went through a few casting directors. But the last one was very good. And she really found me little gems in the rough. You mm -hmm. know? This girl had not been doing anything before, you know. 
and I saw, I saw the audition tape, and you know, I stopped, I called, I said. How did it take to, to, to make a, a movie like Wetlands? How long? How long? About two years to write, you know, and six months of pre-production, and then three months of, between a thing or another, two months, two months and a half of principal photography, and then another, you know, six months, eight months in the editing room. So I would say... Is the editing room years. more difficult to, yeah, the, you know, I mean, if you have to... To, to tell us the most difficult moment that, the, the editing that room you have by far because you know is excruciating you know it's like you know you have uh, you know you, you go out and you buy all the ingredients and they're all on the table and then you go in and you realize you know shit like you know this doesn't work and this doesn't work and you cannot go back out you just have to cook with what you have you know also you go from the high of having you know 120 people behind you, you know, and being like you mm -hmm. know the, the 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 leader and you know people the leader of the pack, right? Mm -hmm. To you know a tiny dark room with two people, you know what I mean? It's it's just very mm. you know it's it fucks with your mind. <laughs> excuse my French. Your excuse. Uh, so now three cult movies and three favorite directors. I'll be a little broader than that. I'll tell you anything that was made in America between 1968 and 1978 is the stuff that I watch compulsively, all of those directors. And then I would add, uh, you know, the trifecta of uh, uh, Fellini, Rossellini, and De Sica. Mm -hmm. you know? Like those, I mean, of course, I love, uh, you know, all sorts of cinema and documentaries I'm in love with. But you know, th these are. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you fell in love with movies when we were a, a, a young kid, you told me that. And uh, did you go to see movies when. Yeah, my father would take me to see the movies that he would like to watch, right? And they were not at all age appropriate for me. <laughs> but Let's still. Tell us a couple of, uh, of, uh, of titles. Well, Deer Hunter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That was one. Instead of uh, Snow White yeah, or... Exactly. <laughs> I would yeah. watch that too. Yeah. Know, I would have or the aristocrats. Thing, right? uh, the aristocrats. Yeah, like I told you the, the other the day. Hunter. Yes. You know, I'm really the first generation that had the choice of going to the movies or watching at home with the, VC with mm -hmm. the VCR, right? Which, you know, was kind of... I mean, people before had the 8 millimeters, 60 millimeters at home. But, you know, it wasn't the same. You know, there were not video shops. No. You know, when I came of age, you know, it started being video shops. So I would, uh, you know, I, if I liked The Deer Hunter, I could watch it 10 times over. And very often I did, you know. Um, tell us your future projects. So I'm adapting uh, uh, with a writer from HBO. I'm adapting Wetlands to be turned into a TV series. Hmm because I think it has the right elements for it to you know, grow as a TV series. I'm making a documentary about Atlantic City this summer, which is the story. And you go back to Atlantic City, yeah, I mean. Back, yeah. which is gonna be you like the squalor. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm a magnet for the loonies. <laughs> like I, I go on the boardwalk and all the crazies just come and flock yes. to me. You know? So tell us the, the, the documentary that you are going to make. You know, it's a story really of the demise of Atlantic City in the past 12 years. But it's through the people that were at the periphery of this famous serial killer case that happened 12 years ago. So it's not a forensic investigation. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to solve a crime. I just want to see, you know, humanity. You know, how these people's lives have been affected, you know, a little bit by the crime, but mostly by the collapse of the city, of Atlantic City. You know, which in a way is not dissimilar than what happened to the country in a broader mm -hmm. sense, you know? And uh, you that, then yes. I just finished the second draft of a new script, which is for a movie, not a series, which is a 1930s, 1940s film about World War II in Italy, in Tuscany. And, um, you know, I've, I've sent it out. And it's, and it's going to be an Italian movie? or It's going to be an Italian story, but told in English. A, because I've always written in English. I feel more comfortable with it. But mostly because, you know, I want it to be a film that can travel the world. And in this way, it certainly can travel the world, you know, and it can attract a big, you know, a big... It's the kind of film that will attract... Can we know a little bit more stars. about it, or...? Uh, it's, it's a story of a hero. You know, it's a very heroic but story. But it's something that you put it up, or...? It's based on true events. Oh, based okay. Events. Eh? 
on true, true events. events. So last question, what, which is the best film story Neville told? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this question. It's like <laughs> the last question that she slipped in yesterday, you know? <laughs> She's like, answer that. I, I don't know. The, and it, honestly, if I knew, yeah. I'd probably go home tonight and start writing about it. That's good. Thank <laughs> you. See that you know the answer. Thank you very much, Emanuele. And thank, thank you. you. All of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.